The next section of today's program will focus on FD research. We are very fortunate to have Millie, many brilliant and dedicated scientists working to enhance and extend the lives of people with FD. Today we will hear about some of the exciting and cutting edge research underway. I am pleased to welcome Dr. Adrian Gilbert, FD parent from Israel, pharmaceutical executive and co-chair of the Foundation's Scientific Advisory Board. Thank you, Lainey. Um, firstly, I want to say that I was just blown away by the art and the um, distinguished um, FD awards. I have to say, I wasn't expecting that and I found it very touching. And if I didn't need motivation and inspiration, I got it from watching that and well done to everyone who uh, contributed to that. So thank you, Lainey, and thanks everyone for staying with us to hear our research updates and our panel discussion. Um, my name is Adrian Gilbert. I'm originally from England. I've been living in Israel for over 30 years. And in my day job, I work in pharmaceutical development for a company called Neuroderm in Israel. And I'm working on, we're working on new treatments for Parkinson's disease. But I also am the father of Tamar, age 20, who I know is watching, who has FD. So working with this scientific advisory board is really a place where my worlds collide and it really is a huge privilege and we have a great group that we work with. So just to remind you, we renewed our scientific advisory board at the end of 2019 and that already seems like a long time ago, pre-COVID. Um, and here in the slide you can see basically our, um, the makeup of our group now. Um, we're a good mixture of uh, scientists, uh, and clinical researchers, and also from industry. Um, Francis and I are the co-chairs, and I have to say it's been a true pleasure to work with Francis. She's a great scientist and a really good, a really good collaborator, who's always volunteering, probably more than me. Um, and I think we have a really nice group get together, and we're starting to see some results. And I think it's been a, a real privilege for us. Um, we've actually had now three full meetings of our advisory board. The last was in early May, just a few weeks ago. And we've been following and supporting different research programs coming out of the US, Italy, Israel, and, J and Japan, and across a range of modalities and approaches. Um, we're really excited by the energy and obviously the progress, which is the most important thing. And today we're gonna give you, I think, a bit of a share, a bit of a taste of, of what's going on and what's happened in the last year. So we'll kick off today's session with my co-chair, Dr. Francis Leftcourt um, from Montana State University. Um, will give us an overview of some of the current leading research programs into FD. Francis. Thanks very much, Adrian. Um, thanks to all of you. It's a pleasure to be here virtually with everyone um, to celebrate FD Day. And um, I, uh, also, sort of, I'm wearing two hats. Um, I'm a neuroscientist um, and I study FD, but I also am a cousin. I had two cousins um, in Montreal who had FD, and um, so it's something that I care deeply about. Um, and it's been a pleasure, uh, likewise, working with Adrian. Um, he's a fabulous collaborator, and the whole scientific advisory board actually has been just a real pleasure and an honor to work with everyone. Okay, so today, yeah, I thought I would give a brief update on some current exciting uh, research developments on FD that we are hopeful at least some of them can lead to treatments. Um, can I have the next slide, please? So how do we get there? Um, so our goal, as um, you've heard today, is uh, to increase levels of this protein called ELP1. It used to be called ICAP, but we're referring to it as ELP1 now. And ELP1 in FD, are, is, the level of F, ELP1 is reduced. So that's the goal, is to increase levels of ELP1. So how do we get there? Um, it's a collaboration between all of us. So we need to all work together, the FD families, the FD Foundation and the Scientific Advisory Board, the wonderful FD clinicians we have um, at NYU and in Israel, the FD research scientists that for me, it's been a privilege to work with, 
And we really have to thank the National Institutes of Health because they have funded many of our grants. And um, so it's uh, for you Americans, it's your tax dollars at work. And lastly, we have to thank Enlorum. I mean, Adrian Craner will tell you about a very exciting development with his research. And Enlorum is a private foundation and they are going to help us tremendously getting the first treatment into an FD patient. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so how do we get there? How do we get to treatment? So there's kind of a roadmap you can think about. Uh, first, it started on the bottom left circle, um, the gene and the mutation, which we are so lucky to have Susan Slavenhoft in our group. Um, she is an amazing geneticist at uh, Harvard and MGH, and she, uh, with Jim Gazella, identified the original gene and the mutation, the founder mutation that uh, Dr. Kaufman described, and um, these other, uh, the other mutations that have been described. Um, once you have the mutation, then you can start making animal models. And many of us have chosen mouse. And so you can in introduce the mutation or delete the gene. There are different ways to do it, but you can make a mouse model that then can be used to one, understand what's going wrong in FD, um, what's happening to the neurons, and two, um, use these mice to test potential therapeutics. And then if things look good in mice, um, then we can try to translate that to patients and test in uh, clinical trials. And so that's sort of the roadmap for most of us. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so what is the problem in FD? So as all of you know, our genes are made up of DNA and that DNA needs to be copied to RNA. And then that mRNA has to be decoded or translated to make protein, okay? So uh, in FD, there's a problem. We have a mutation in the DNA. So if I can have the next slide, please. So you can see in the DNA that's highlighted in the circle, there's one um, nucleotide or base. So each of those letters are called bases or nucleotides, and one of them is mutated. And right now I'm talking about the founder mutation, but it, um, you can just use this as a general principle for what's going on in FD. So because of that one mutation, one base being different, there's a problem making the messenger RNA. And if there's a problem making messenger RNA, we're gonna have reduced levels of the ELP1 protein. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? So this problem of making the messenger RNA is called splicing, okay? So we have a problem in splicing. And um, to understand splicing, I thought we could think about the theme song from Sesame Street. So if you look at the two lines on the bottom, you can see there are red words there, but separating the red words are a bunch of these nucleotides or bases, okay? So in that noise, you can see though, that, you know, there's our, the beginning of our Sesame Street theme song, you know, sunny days sweeping the clouds away. Okay, so we want to um, distinguish the words sunny day sweeping the clouds away from all those other bases or nucleotides, okay? So how do we do that? So if I could have the next slide. So there's, you can see all those scissors. So there's actually a cutting process that takes place called splicing, where we splice, we separate, we cut the words that we want in our theme song and the, uh, parts of the DNA we want for um, to uh, end up in our being copied into our messenger RNA, and then the parts that we don't need, okay? So can I have the next slide? Okay, so again, that process of cutting is called splicing. And as a result, we are left with the important parts of the 
RNA, which are called the exons, okay? So we keep the exons and we get rid of the introns. And if you remember, Dr. Kaufman mentioned that these new mutations arose from doing an exome search. So that was searching all the exons to see if there were any problems. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so remember though, in FD, we have a mutation in one of those bases. And you can see here, I'm just um, highlighting a, a potential mutation after the word clouds, okay? So imagine if there was a mutation there after the word clouds, and that prevented those scissors from working well to, to cut out that word clouds, which is an important part of the Sesame Street theme song. And it's an imagine it's an important part of the gene for ELP1. Okay, can I have the next slide? So if we can't cut the word clouds out, we get this kind of meaningless message, right? We get sunny days sweeping the away. Well, what does that mean? That doesn't make a lot of sense. Can I have the next slide? So as a result of that one mutation, we aren't getting a normal version of the Sesame Street theme song. And in our case, we aren't going to get normal levels of the messenger RNA for ELP1 and so we're gonna have reduced levels of the ELP1 protein. And that's our problem. So can I have the next slide, please? So what's the solution? The solution is to increase the inclusion of that mix in, missing exon. So like the word clouds, so that the ELP1 messenger RNA can be made properly. And luckily we have two brilliant scientists working with us, they're both on the scientific advisory board and they have active research programs and who are trying to fix that splicing problem, okay? So one of them is Dr. Adrian Craner, who's at Cold Spring Harbor Labs. And he, in his lab, developed a solution that fixes that splicing using a method called antisense oligonucleotides. And he'll be talking about that. And he has formed this collaboration with Dr. Kaufman, uh, with and Lorem, this foundation to try one of Adrian Craner's molecule, these ASOs in a patient with FD. And this is absolutely, um, it's a new day. This is such an exciting and important development. And I'm personally so thankful to Dr. Craner for doing this. And then we also have Dr. Susan Slagenhop at Mass General and Harvard Medical School, who has done an incredible series of, of elegant studies identifying small molecules in collaboration with the company PTC Therapeutics that have identified small molecules can, that can also increase the splicing process and lead to increasing levels of the ELP1 protein. She's gonna talk about that. And she also has a second strategy working with a great scientist in Italy, Dr. Franco Pagani, on these U1 sRNAs that also can increase splicing. So next slide, please. In my lab, we're trying a different approach. Our approach is what's called gene therapy, where you introduce into a neuron a healthy copy of the ELP1 gene. And this is a project that we are doing in collaboration with two terrific scientists, Dr. Claudio Punzo, who's at University of Massachusetts Medical School, and Dr. Elisabetta Marini, who's working with Sue Slagenhop's group at Mass General. Um, so it's uh, still, uh, I'm gonna show you a tiny bit of data. Um, I can tell you that we are still uh, optimizing our methods, but we're starting to get some promising results and it's early, but I wanted to share them with you. Um, oh, I'm gonna do that in the research talk, sorry. So you'll hear more about that in a few minutes. Let's go to the last slide. The last slide is another approach happening in my lab where um, we're, uh, we're, think, we're wondering about um, whether there's a problem with metabolism in general in people with FD. So for example, metabolism 
is a result of many factors, but it's turning out that one of the factors that can influence our metabolism is the communication between all the bacteria that live in our guts, or, which is also called the microbiome, and the brain. And it turns out those bacteria in our gut and our brain communicate like crazy. And they communicate with the liver, which plays a key role in metabolism. And together they can influence our, our overall health, our digestion, our nutrient balance, um, and our overall metabolism. And so I'm working with two fabulous scientists at MSU, Seth Walk and Valerie Copier. And together with, we've been collaborating with the Dysautonomia Center with Dr. Kaufman and Maria and Lucy and all of you families with FD uh, family members who are sending us samples. Um, and we're starting to find um, disturbances in the metabolism and we're writing up those data now. And I'll tell you more about that later. And I think there's, those, there's maybe one last slide. So I want to thank you all very much. And um, uh, I'm going to hand it back, I think, to Adrian now. Yes. Yes, we have a very rare occasion where there's an, two Adrians, and Adrian Gilbert and, of course, Adrian Craner. Um, so I hope you can keep track. Uh, thank you, Francis. I think we, we got what was an excellent presentation. Um, so we have three directions that we're trying to use here or being trying to use by the researchers um, to modify how our ELP1 protein um, is uh, spliced. And what we're actually um, going to hear now from are from the three researchers, um, Sue, um, Francis about gene therapy, um, Sue about small molecules and Adrian about the antisense oligos. Um, they're going to give us a bit more insight into their approaches. And I think we're very, very lucky to have such high caliber researchers um, working, working in our field. So without further words, I'll go straight to Sue, who's going to talk about her small molecule approaches. Thank you so much, Adrian, And thank you, Francis, for that beautiful introduction to all of our work. I'm really, really pleased to be here today. Um, I'd like to begin by introducing my remarkable FD team. So this is typically what you're seeing on this slide is what we look like uh, during the pandemic when we have lab meetings. I want to assure you that they're all in the lab working very hard, but we um, have our lab meetings virtually. So from the top left is Daddy Gao. Then uh, myself, as you can see, then Emily Kirshner, Anil Chakuri, Emily Logan, Elisabetta Marini, Ricardo Harapal, who just joined our team a few days ago, and Jess Bolduck. They're really responsible for all of the remarkable work that we do on FD, and I, want, I hope that you'll join me in thanking them for all of their hard work. This year marks 30 years for me at Mass General, which I find a little hard to believe. Uh, but it, that means that I've been working on FD for just about as long, so almost 30 years. So uh, it, we've made tremendous progress. We still have a ways to go, but I'm very, very excited about all of the work that you'll hear today. Can I have the next slide, please? So as Francis explained, FD is caused by a splicing mutation that causes incomplete exclusion of exon 20 in the ELP1 gene. And this leads to patients not having enough ELP1 protein, particularly in their nervous system. Next slide, please. So how can we treat FD? One way is to increase the inclusion of exon 20, as Francis explained, which will increase the amount of ELP1 protein, as I'm showing on this slide. What we need to accomplish is increased ELP1 protein. And today you'll hear about three different methods that um, we are working on to do this. So the next slide, please. My lab is focused on developing a small molecule oral drug that will increase exon 20 inclusion. Starting with Kinetin that you all have heard about over the years, we've been funded by the NINDS Blueprint for Neurotherapeutics Network, which led to the creation of a much more effective compound shown in the middle. And then we partnered with PTC Therapeutics to continue the development of a drug, which led to the creation of a compound that is 10,000 times more potent than Kinetin. This drug can get into the brain 
and increased levels of ELP1 protein in our mice. And just last month, we received the good news that this drug also passed the first steps in the required safety testing. So as you all know, PTC Therapeutics canceled their clinical development program for FD in 2019. However, they have pledged to partner with my team, with the FD Foundation, as well as with the FD Center to map out a path to bring this promising treatment to FD patients. So stay tuned as we move this forward. Next slide, please. Another method that we're working on was created by Dr. Franco Pagani, whose lab is in Italy. Franco has identified a way to modify an important component of the splicing machinery, and he makes it match the FD mutation, which also leads to inclusion of exon 20. So we are continue to work with Franco on this method of treating FD. And in my lab, we're focused on testing this method in our mice by treating the retinas. And so our goal is to see if we can rescue splicing in the retina and prevent the loss of retinal ganglion cells and hopefully, hopefully present, prevent blindness. And then the last slide, please. So in closing, I just want to reiterate that all of the exciting work that you'll hear about today has been possible because all of the FD researchers continue to work collaboratively. Coming up with a treatment that targets the molecular defect in FD will take all of us working together. And with the leadership that Francis and Adrian have provided, I think that we are well working well along this path. But it will also take all of you. We're working to advance all of these potential treatments at the same time. We're not choosing one over another. We're pushing forward with all of them with the goal of getting something to patients quickly. And when the time comes, we'll need all of you to be ready to participate in clinical trials so that we can finally determine if increasing the level of EOP1 protein in patients will benefit. So thank you. I look forward to um, continuing to hear the rest of the talks and to participating in the question and answer session at the end. And now I believe I turn it directly over to Francis. Okay, thank you, Sue. That was a terrific talk and um, uh, I, I just love your work. It's so it's so promising. Um, okay, so I'm gonna just give a brief update on our work uh, trying to introduce a healthy copy of the ELP1 gene in the retina. And, um, you know, as Sue mentioned, um, we know in FD, you know, there are um, issues that we hope to help um, all through the body, cardiovascular problems, the cri autonomic crises, the ataxia, so we know we're well aware um, of all these problems and we really want to hopefully address all of them, but we need something um, very measurable, something we can quantify and see progress um, uh, quickly and so, uh, or clearly. And one way to do that is to start with the eye. And, um, you know, I know for my cousin, uh, when he, you know, he, like all of you with FD, he was so brave and struggled so long and, you know, with all the autonomic problems. But when he started losing his vision, it really sapped his spirit. And that was a real struggle. And so that, to me, convinced me to really start to focus on the retina. So what you're seeing here is an actual picture of a retina in a mouse um, taken by a fabulous graduate student in my lab, Anastasia Schultz. And in the arrows are pointing to those purple round balls. And those purple round balls are called retinal ganglion cells. And those are the actual neurons we, that die in FD. And these are the cells all of us who are working on the retina are trying to save. Because if we can save those cells, those purple cells um, surrounded, that are there surrounded by the green support cells called glia, if we can keep those purple cells alive, then nobody will lose their vision in FD. Okay, can I have the next slide, please? Okay, so now you're seeing a picture of an eye, and in the back of the eye, in blue, turquoise, now you're seeing the retinal ganglion cells. So 
So in turquoise are, are sort of five retinal ganglion cells I've put there. And what's important to notice is those retinal ganglion cells, they extend long um, uh, processes that are called axons, okay? And those axons form the optic nerve. And it's those axons that will um, travel all the way to the brain that communicate all the visual information you see. So the visual information comes into your, I mean, the light comes into your eye and because of the way the cells in the retina work, they start to make meaning out of all those photons of light. And then they send that information to the brain through those axons, okay? So if anything happens to those retinal ganglion cells, bodies or to their axons, we are going to see, and here I um, have a blue arrow pointing to all these beautiful children that had FD. I think all those children are adults now. Um, but anyway, we won't see those beautiful children, and we won't see all that gorgeous art that all of you with FD are making. So we know that this is very important to save these retinal ganglion cells and their axons. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so I apologize for the slide. It's um, not perfect for this talk, but if you can focus on what this, what we're seeing here is a count of retinal ganglion cells in different mouse eyes that have received different concentrations of the ELP1 gene in the virus or of just a control or their control eyes or their mutant eyes. Okay, that's all mixed in here. But the important thing to notice is if you look at the third um, gray bar there from the left side, that you can see that bar is a little bit higher than the bars next to it, okay? It's not as high as the tallest bars on the right, but it's a little bit higher and it's statistically significant than the others. It's about 14% higher. So, which means we are starting to rescue some retinal ganglion cells. So we have a little bit more retinal ganglion cells. And this was done before we'd even optimized the injection procedure. And this is work done by a graduate student in the lab, Colin King. But I wanna tell you the exciting thing we found, and that's on the next slide. Next slide, please. Is we think we're starting to save axons, okay? So if you look in the top panel, you're seeing pictures of retinas from three different mice. The one on the left, you can see the yellow arrow is pointing to some axons. That's in a control wild type mouse. The picture in the middle is from a mutant retina that does not is not making the ELP1 protein. And you can see, you don't see any axons there. And then the one on the right with the yellow arrow pointing to it, you can start to see some axons again. And that's a mutant that was treated with one of the concentrations of the ELP1 gene. And then on the bottom panel, you can see these axons um, and higher magnification. And so you can see on the left side in the control, nice healthy axons. In the middle that did not get the ELP1 gene, you're not seeing axons, but in the panel on the right, um, which is from a mutant that did get the ELP1 gene, we're starting to get some axons. And so we are, we don't know what this means. It could mean a few different things, but um, we're pursuing this and we're hoping that this is an indication that um, this approach might be helpful for um, preserving those retinal ganglion cells and preventing them from dying. And then lastly, if I could have the last slide, I just want to thank everyone. I want to thank the National Eye Institute at the NIH for funding this work. Thank the wonderful people in my lab, um, especially Marta Chavera and Colin King and Anastasia Schultz who've been doing this work and our fabulous collaborator uh, who helped us with the design of the vectors uh, to be used here and how to analyze the retina, uh, Claudio Punzo at University of Mass Medical School. So um, that's it, and I think I get to introduce my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Adrian Craner. 
Uh, thank you so much, Francis. Uh, it's such a pleasure uh, to participate in FD Day uh, this year. Uh, so I'm Adrian Craner. I uh, work at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in Long Island, and uh, where I've been for 35 years this year. And uh, my lab uh, specializes in the, in the process that uh, Francis introduced, RNA splicing, and we use we also use antisense technology to uh, try to develop therapeutics for uh, rare diseases. So I want to uh, introduce today uh, our efforts to, to um, develop um, an antisense oligonucleotide for FD. Next slide, please. So uh, what are antisense oligonucleotides or ASOs? Uh, they are short synthetic single-stranded nucleic acids, meaning DNA-like and RNA-like and they bind to an mRNA target by base pairing, the same forces that hold the two strands of DNA together. Uh, at the bottom on the right, you see an antisense oligonucleotide. You can see that it's, it's short. It has a few nucleotides as building blocks. And um, a, a little above that is an, a messenger RNA, which has the same type of information, but it's a longer molecule. And then between the two, uh, is a duplex. That, in other words, these two strands, the mRNA and the ASO, can find each other because of the sequence and form uh, this, this duplex or helix. So the sequence of an ASO determines to which mRNA it binds and exactly where along that mRNA it will bind. Now, if, if we design an ASO in such a way that uh, it binds to an mRNA before it undergoes RNA splicing, then the ASO can affect how splicing occurs. Uh, in the instance that we're all interested in, uh, the, the goal is to restore efficient splicing of exon 20 in ALP1 with the FD mutation. And uh, I should also mention that compared to RNA or DNA, the nucleic acids, ASOs have special chemical modifications that uh, make them more drug-like. Next slide, please. So um, this uh, outlines the entire development process for an ASO drug uh, called nusinersen or Spenraza that uh, we developed several years ago in collaboration with Ionis Pharmaceuticals and later with Biogen. And so you can see the different stages there in preclinical development and, and then clinical development. And, and uh, my lab at Cold Spring Harbor was involved in the preclinical stages, which is shown there in orange. So you can see the timeline, which is uh, fairly extended. And um, so actually in, in our work on the FD ASO, we have pretty much finished that, that preclinical stage. Indeed, a couple of years ago or more, we were already done. And the challenge that we have faced is how to take it uh, to the next stage, clinical development. And, and the challenge, as you know, is that FD is a, is a very rare disease compared to SMA, the drug for which Nusinersen was developed. SMA is 100 to 1,000 to times more, more prevalent than FD. And so it's, it's uh, in this case, FD, it's uh, harder to motivate uh, biotech and pharma to, to invest in clinical development. But we think that we are now in a great position to do so, and also that the timeline uh, for clinical development will be uh, much faster than in this earlier case, which was uh, the first application of an ASO of this type. But uh, you should know that uh, Nusinersen was approved at the end of 2016 by the FDA. It's already been in more than 11,000 patients with SMA. Um, so the next uh, stages are uh, large-scale manufacture and then testing uh, for safety and tolerability in, 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 in animals, for example, in, in monkeys, uh, and then later uh, interacting with the Food and Drug Administration to get authorization to begin to test uh, this such a drug in, in a small number of patients uh, to begin to test it, its real efficacy in the clinic. May I have the next slide, please? So uh, these are uh, the ASOs of this type that, that modify splicing that are currently in clinical use. And so they include nusinersen for spinal muscular atrophy, which is a motor neuron disease, 
and then uh, three other drugs, adiplirsin, golodirsin, and biltolarsin, which were developed for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this shows uh, the sequence, the nucleotide sequence of nucinersin or spinbraza, and below that, that of the uh, ASO that we have developed for familial dysautonomia. So importantly, uh, these two molecules have the exact same ke uh, chemical building groups. So the chemistry is the same. The difference, of course, is the actual sequence and also slightly longer in the case of the FD ASO. Uh, and the sequences, if you recall, dictate uh, to which mRNA each of these molecules binds. So the FDASO is designed to bind to the mRNA from the LP1 gene. Uh, uh, Spinraza or nucinersin binds to the mRNA from a gene called SMN2. Uh, next slide, please. So fortunately, uh, there is a new foundation uh, called N. Lorem, which is uh, a branch, uh, in a sense, of uh, Ionis Pharmaceuticals. And their mission is to bring uh, ASO technology and ASO drugs to uh, patients with ultra-rare diseases. And, and uh, what's on their radar are diseases where there's somewhere between one and ten patients uh, with that uh, disease, so it's not a commercially viable opportunity. Um, so FD is certainly more than that, so we, we face that challenge, but I'm happy to say that uh, we have formally applied to Anne Lorem uh, to work with us on this, and uh, the application was submitted uh, by Dr. Kaufman, and uh, it has been accepted. Uh, so if I can have uh, the next slide, please. So um, they have formally agreed to work with us to help with the clinical development of the FD ASO. Uh, this application was approved uh, on March 23 of this year, and, uh, and Dr. Kaufman and I already had the kickoff call with the Ann Lauren representatives just a few days ago, May 26th. And, and so these are the next steps. The, um, the, uh, a new, new designs based on that uh, lead molecule whose sequence I showed you will be uh, prepared uh, to compare to that ASO and select the best clinical candidate. And so th th there, this comparison will be based on activity assays that are done in cells and in uh, one of the mouse models that Dr. Slagenhaupt developed. Um, then uh, these, in addition, these uh, uh, candidates will be compared in terms of the, the tolerability when they are injected into mice and rats. Uh, and then uh, a full talk study will be carried out by N. Lorem and Ionis Pharmaceuticals. And so this is the main way in which they are supporting uh, the next steps. And if all goes according to plan, uh, it should be possible to uh, dose the first patient with the clinical candidate uh, in the second half of next year. And uh, this would be done um, by Dr. Kaufman's team at NYU Langone. So we're very excited uh, that we, we've reached this point finally and that uh, we are working with Ann Lawrence help. And um, so that's all I, I wanted to tell you today, but I look forward to uh, the Q&A and the panel, which I believe uh, follows this. Thank you so much for your attention. Well, thank you all. Um, I think we're really blessed to have such high caliber uh, researchers um, and such promising directions. Um, I'd like to thank each of our presenters, um, Francis, uh, Sue, and Adrian. And I also think we've reached a very, very exciting moment um, with the support of Enlorum, that the antisense oligo looks like it can be in clinical next year, and we have support for that to bring it through the preclinical testing, which is an amazing, an amazing um, milestone. And thank you to, to Adrian and to, to Horacia for, for achieving that. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to hold a Q&A um, with our panel, as you can see them, um, who have presented. And, I, and we've, of course, um, we've got Dr. Horacio Kaufman um, from the Treatment Center in New York um, to join us. Um, and we hope that these directions are going to be translated into, into clinical um, activities and clinical trials um, in the not too distant future. So if you have, everyone has questions that you'd like to ask about what you've heard or about other things, please post them on the chat. 
I have one eye that I've been looking, and I know my uh, my SAB colleague Adam is uh, is following up carefully on those uh, on those questions. Um, but what we thought we'll do is we'll kick it off with some questions um, which we've already received. So I'm going to start with a question for Adrian, who made the last presentation. So can you tell us a little bit, Adrian, about what Spinraza did for spinal muscular, muscular atrophy patients? And is there anything that could help us to understand what we might expect for the ASO for FD? Yes, uh, thank you for the question. Well, so the uh, Nusnersen was the first drug that was approved for SMA. Uh, and um, so it, it has had a radical um, impact on this disease. It, it, it's, it's considered what's called a disease modifying therapy because it really has changed the course of the disease. Uh, happily, in, 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 uh, for SMA, there are now two additional drugs that have been approved. One is a gene therapy drug and the other is a small molecule. So you, in, by the same uh, token, you know, in FD, as you've heard, um, all three types of approaches are being pursued. And that it's great to have as many uh, options for treatment as possible. So what has happened in SMA is that uh, uh, there, there is an impact on survival, there is an impact on motor function, and not just um, stopping the course of this progressive disease, but actually allowing improvements over time. Uh, one important lesson has been that the earlier the, the time of initial treatment, then the greater the impact. Uh, so much so that um, uh, patients who, are, who begin treatment as newborns, even before the onset of symptoms, develop normally. But, but even for later treatment, there are measurable impacts and measurable improvements in quality of life. Now, these are different diseases, different drugs. The principles are similar. And I think the lessons we've learned about uh, how to develop the, this type of drug and how to administer and so on, I think will be very valuable. But we're not going to know for certain until uh, clinical studies are done. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, that really does give us cause for some optimism. Um, I'm going to ask Sue a question now. Um, and this is more of a broader question about the different approaches where we've spoken about small molecules, gene therapy, and antisense oligos. Um, how, how, could they, how could we expect to see differences as a patient if I was thinking about being part of those trials and going forward? What would be the differences you would expect to see for the patient both in terms of their safety or in terms of their efficacy? I know it's a tough question, but I'm interested to hear your idea. I know, it is a tough one. I, I mean, I guess the big, the big overarching answer is we're not sure yet, but we do, know, we do know a lot. I mean, we've talked about three different ways to increase exon 20 inclusion and increase ELP1 protein, the antisense oligo that uh, Dr. Craner talked about, the small molecule and a modified U1 that I talked about. And so these will differ by method of delivery, as well as how they work to alter splicing, but they should all lead to an increase in ELP1 protein in cells. And the fourth method, gene therapy, really has nothing to do with splicing, but will rather introduce a normal copy of the gene, as Francis described to us. So none of these therapies are meant to specifically treat the symptoms of FD, like the drugs that are currently used, but they're meant to correct the molecular cause of the disease. So we don't know, as I mentioned, if increasing the amount of ELP1 protein will modify the progression of FD. We believe that it will work um, based on the work that we've done in FD mice, as well as the exciting work that you just heard about from Dr. Craner in spinal muscular atrophy. But until we get one of these types of treatments into FD patients, we just won't know. And that again, you'll hear my message of the day is why we'll need all of you to uh, participate in clinical trials as we go forward. We've actually just been asked about your expectation specifically of the um, small molecule oral medication. Is there something mm -hmm. specifically based on what you've seen on the animal studies that will give you some indication of what that might be able to do for patients? Yes, um, some of the things that we've seen, and again, we've studied this drug in mice that have FD, and um, we have been able to see that the drug can rescue the retinal ganglion cells 
that um, Francis described, as well as improve gait. Um, and so our, our hope is, is that um, it improves proprioception and gait and rescues neurons that are in the dorsal root ganglia. And so this is all very exciting. Of course, as we've talked to you about in the past, mice aren't people, but the, you know, these mice are a very good model of FD. And so we have been able to see improvement in many of these characteristics in the mice using this small molecule. Okay, thank you. That, that, that's fascinating. Um, I just hope we can get quickly into clinical. That's really what, and that's yes. what people are asking us as well, mm -hmm. um, how long this is going to take. So I'm gonna go straight to, to Horatio. Um, when can we expect to see some clinical trials um, with some of these treatments? And I know in the Enlorum um, or the Enlorum um, direction is probably the soonest one. When, when do you think that could happen? Well, let me let me first digress for a second. Um, I, I, I'm delighted with the presentations and with what Sue told us and Francis and Adrian. Uh, because the three of them focus on the eye, on the on the retina, and each of them also show you that there's an animal model, that the problem in retina, those ganglion cells that we are trying to preserve or, or you know, prevent them from, from going wrong, uh, we can, we are potentially able to do that, but we need everybody to come and have the OCT at the center. That's something that we cannot do through telemedicine. So all these um, um, attempts that think to the incredible minds of the three researchers, uh, you know, Adrian, Sue, and Francis, that they, they have possible forms to save those neurons, um, how can we do it? Well, it's very important that we have the OCT. It's based on what we saw in the OCT when you come to the clinic. That picture that we take is that these guys are able to think in a way to save those neurons. So you, you have to come to have the OCT. That's number one. Number two, Adrian, uh, Adrian Craner, right, uh, was bold enough to tell us that he will have, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm just sort of joking that he was bold. I mean, he's optimistic, but he's bold, of course. He already solved one disease. So we hope that we will be able to solve a second disease and maybe with an approach of these three different approaches all working together. And perhaps, perhaps to try to answer your question for next year, we will have the first patient. Trust me, I, we would all love to say we, we started. Neither of us can sleep thinking in when are we gonna have this and we all want to um, announce it. So I'm throwing the, the glove to these three researchers and the drug developer, other Adrian, right? Let's. Let's get it done. We are we are ready to start. If you do all the toxicology and give us the tools, we'll give you the tools. You'll you'll give us the magic, and we'll we'll get to the promised land. But we'll we'll do it. We we need everybody's help. So come to the center to have the OCT and the same well, have the OCT because that is what's going. We we need to measure, and that's crucial. So th thank you for your answer. I mean, that's a very honest answer um, and a direct one. And also it's a reminder to all of those who are watching this to go in and get tested, get their OCT, get their measurements in and be part of that natural history study. Um, and I think that's a really, really important um, key success factor for anything to happen clinically. Um, I think I think what we're looking for is to, to challenge ourselves how, what, how many trials and what were the best trials that we could do. But this really is an exciting time, um, and it's soon it's going to be up to the patients to do their bit as well, we hope. Um, I'm going to go to Francis now um, to tell us a little bit more about the ocular gene therapy. Um, we're actually being asked, why are you focusing on the eye um, in the chat? 
and I think that's a very good question. Um, and I think some are also of these, eye th these ocular therapies, ocular being delivery to the eye, are relevant to systemic as into the whole body, and some of them are specific to the eye. So maybe you could help answer that question. Why the eye and how is it going with the gene therapy approach to the eye? Francis. Okay. Um, so yes, so all of these techniques that we're talking about today, gene therapy or the antisense oligos or the small molecules, they could be used systemically, no question. Um, all of them can, all of them have been used. So for example, SMA, you know, the disease that Adrian worked on, um, uh, the, the, as the uh, ASOs are delivered systemically, okay? Um, small molecules, what Sue talked about, the great advantage there is their pills that are taken orally and then they spread throughout the body. So they too can affect any tissue in the body. Gene therapy also can be delivered systemically. Um, the deal with gene therapy, why we're focusing on the eye first is the virus for the gene therapy is expensive. And if you're gonna do something systemically, you're gonna need a lot more virus than if you go into a small space, which the eye is. So one reason is just um, expense because we can deliver uh, small amounts of virus to the eye. So it's not as an expensive um, at this stage of the research. The other reason is um, the endpoints. You need very, very clear defined endpoints to know if you have an improvement. Is your therapy working? Um, so as uh, Dr. Kaufman described, you know, the way in patients we're gonna figure out if the ocular treatment is working is by comparing your OCT images. So the OCT measures the thickness of those axons. So remember I told you about those axons that have to get to the brain. Well, in the OCT, you can actually measure how thick those axons are. And the thicker they are, the better, the more axons you have then. So that's a real defined measurement you can make. Um, and we can do something similar in the mice. So in the mice, we can actually quantify, we can actually count the number of retinal ganglion cells. And so we can ask, you know, if we inject the virus into the eye using very little virus then, um, can we see a measurable, quantifiable, repeatable increase in the number of retinal ganglion cells? Can we see that there are more axons? So it's something very um, defined and clear to measure, to document, um, essentially what's called proof of concept. So if it works in the eye, then we will feel more confident in investing yes. the funds we would need to do something systemically. Okay, so that really helps us. So it's really like a stepping stone. First of all, we would prove the concept in the eye, and then we would be able to go on and think about systemic therapies. Um, I'm actually, I just want to answer a question that Lisa asked about the OCT scans. We do them in Israel. I know that because I've taken Tamar to OCT scans, and I know that we enter the data. Um, so this is data which is being collected um, after the centers in Israel, as well as um, in the US. And I think it's really important that we can contribute to that. I'm gonna ask a question now back to Adrian, um, which came up earlier. Um, where we were being asked actually about the mRNA and CRISPR um, advances in research which have been made, particularly this year. I know the mRNA vaccines that we've all been, many of us have been getting, Moderna and, uh, um, and the, the co uh, uh, Pfizer vaccines. Um, are these relevant to helping treatments with FD? Is there any reason to believe that these kinds of approaches could be advantageous to us in FD? Obviously, we're looking at the three we presented here, but it doesn't mean we're not looking further afield as well. So Adrian, what's your, what's your yeah, view on that? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I you know, when messenger RNA technology began to be developed, it was viewed as, a, as an alternative to gene therapy, but, but then also vaccines and, and there are other applications. Uh, the issue is, so in principle, um, one could prepare a messenger RNA for the ELP, protein. It's a fairly large messenger RNA. 
And then the question is how to deliver it and where. Uh, the, the messenger RNA vaccines are given as um, uh, lipid nanoparticles, essentially encapsulated in, in, in a bit of fat. But um, I think that uh, the, it, the duration of action of such a messenger RNA is not very long. For a vaccine, that's fine. You just need it to be there uh, to, to be translated into a protein, and that has to stay long enough to stimulate uh, the immune system. But if you're talking about a, a therapy, you need to have that protein all the time. And so you would have to give messenger RNA injections, I don't know, I'm guessing, possibly once a week. Uh, you need very large amounts of it. You need it to be everywhere uh, that matters. So it, I don't think it's impossible, but uh, I think it's cha a challenge. I think that the uh, current um, directions that I see messenger RNA technology going to is vaccines for various infectious diseases, uh, some applications in, in cancer therapy, but I, maybe it's a question of time and technological okay. development. So it is an interesting platform. Okay, but clearly the, 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 where we would need the mRNA, the amount that we would need is kind of a challenge given the way it's delivered yeah. and also the cost which would be involved. Um, whereas right. that makes sense obviously for, for immunization and, and potentially for cancer, but in our case, it's not, it may be more challenging. Okay, right. I'm going to come back. There was a question to Sue about the age of your mice. What happens, is, do you see a difference between the more mature, the older mice and the younger mice? I mean, not everyone here we're talking about in our FD population are newborns or pediatric, where some of us, mm -hmm. fortunately and happily, are getting to good ages. So is there anything we can read into the mouse models and the age of the mice and what we can expect from some of these drugs? Well, thanks for that question. Um, we're actually working on this right now. We, most of the trials that we've done in our mice, we've started treating our mice when they were very young. So they're born with FD disease, and then we begin the treatment soon thereafter. And the reason we do that is, as Francis mentioned, we need proof of principle. Uh, we need to prove that in the best case scenario, and that would be if we could treat a baby right after they were born, that this is going to work. But we understand certainly that the real question is, what happens if we treat an FD patient when they're 10 or 15 or 20? And so we're beginning these studies right now. We started enrolling mice in a trial in the lab, and we are going to um, treat them with a drug that, and we'll start the treatment much later. So we'll be able to get some first insights because in all of the, the um, things that we've tried so far, we've treated mice when they were very young. So hopefully soon we'll have some insight on exactly what can be rescued uh, when we treat later. Okay, so that, that's certainly encouraging and it's certainly reason for, for us to believe that it's relevant treatment also for mature mice. So I have a question for Horacio now. Um, we don't have that many patients. I mean, let's face it, how many? Well, there are several hundred around the world. Um, with a few centers, how are we going to, I mean, obviously this is the challenge that we would um, be able to bring different um, therapies, um, but how can we make the most, do you think, of the patients that we do have to maximize our opportunity to evaluate these, these therapies and to bring one of them hopefully forward? Yeah. Look, our goal is to, to be able to treat everybody. Right, so I, I would like to, to establish that first. Our goal is to, to treat everybody uh, early and not so early and late. Um, we, we do have a constraint that you heard today, which is the need to show uh, proof of concept, meaning that the drug is working. For that, it seems that the younger the person, uh, the easier it is. So we, we may be obliged to start um, with very few patients early on, um, but only with the goal that if quickly an effect is detected, a signal of efficacy is detected, that everybody in the community will have uh, access to the drug, possible access to the drug. And that's why I want to emphasize that everybody should 
come to the center and uh, send all the OCD, of course, also in Israel and all over. It's crucial to have these data because those are the ones that can be evaluated to, to participate in this trial. Um, I, I, I hope I answer, Adrian, meaning... You did. We, we, may, we may be in the difficult position of having to choose a few people to start. Uh, at the same time, the idea is that everybody should be able to, to, to have access to the treatment. Okay. Adrian, I think we all have I to be honest. Something? Yeah, go ahead. I, I just wanted to add something to what um, Horatio said. Something that's very important to keep in mind is that all of these um, different methods will inform the other. So whether it's the ASO, and hopefully that will be the first into patients, or a small molecule, or the U1, what we don't know is if increasing ELP1 protein, which they all aim to do, will be beneficial. As soon as we know that these treatments are first safe, and then that increasing ELP1 protein is beneficial, that will really open the door to the development of the ones that are that are the followers, right? Because we'll know that they're going to work if we can just get them into patients. So I think which that's why we're pushing all of these forward at the same time. I, I think that's very important to say. I also think it's very clear that we have to say in the world of drug development, you know, it's not a hundred percent chance that any of these are going to work. They're all, they're all, um, we're all trying very hard and we're all learning about each of them and comparing in the data. We can't guarantee any of them will succeed. A great situation would where we would get all three to go forward, um, potentially as treatments, but even if we got to one, that would still be an amazing outcome. So we have to be honest, we're doing everything we can and I don't want anyone to walk away with thinking this, that that's it, it's done. It's just a matter of waiting for the time to pass. But we do see that we have real directions from amazing centers and scientists, original, important, groundbreaking research in, in FD, which are leading to the treatments which are we hopefully are going to get into the clinic very soon. And I think that's a very optimistic message. I want to come back um, something actually to Francis. I want to ask her, a, in one of your slides, you didn't overplay it, but you talked about the role of a healthy gut biosome for FD. Um, is there anything that you can tell patients um, about how we could, what we could do to help our, um, our general health in FD um, through the biosome, what you think you can learn um, and what we should do with that? Yeah, it's turning out to be really interesting. So it's clear, so we've been, um, okay, from the microbiome data, we know that the microbes in the gut of people with FD is different than um, their relatives. So we are, we've analyzed the data two ways. One, we, we've gotten stool samples from patients and from one of their relatives that they live with. So we can kind of control somewhat for environment. And we've also, we've um, analyzed the samples in pairs and also just randomized everything and analyzed all the samples. And both cases, we find the patients have um, many fewer species of bacteria in the gut. It's more, um, it's uh, less rich. So usually the more diversity you have in your gut, the more different numbers of species you have, the better you are prepared to deal with different, um, different situations you can encounter nutritionally. So the goal now will be to dive deeper and try to figure out which bacteria, I mean, the goal would be to find out which bacteria are different and then ideally develop precision treatments for patients. And so to add back in specific bacteria whose numbers are reduced, for example, yep. um, that that's kind of the take home from the gut microbiome so far. I mean, it's a, it's a very exciting area. There are companies, I know there's a company called Biomics in Israel, um, and they're working on, I think, uh, colon treatments, and they've got big pharma behind them. It's a lot of big companies are looking at how we can understand our gut, what they call our gut flora, as in what lives in our gut, and to understand the differences to see what can help us um, to treat diseases unrelated to the gut. 
it's a, it's a fascinating can, can area. I mention, thank, thank you. Can I mention one more point? So in our mice, we did, I'll tell you, we did one experiment where we, so we, we get the same thing in our mice, the, the, um, our FD, one of our mouse models for FD, the microbiome is very different um, in the mice that have the FD mutation versus the control mice. And we find big differences if we uh, house the mice together, the mutant and control mice together versus raise the mutants in separate cages from the controls. And the reason is, this is gonna sound yucky, I hope it's not gonna ruin your meal, but the mice eat each other's um, pellets, poop, okay? So they're <laughs> actually mixing their microbes. And so in the mice that live, the mutant mice that live in the cages with the healthy mice, we find those mice are actually healthier. So the mutant mice actually become healthier all around in many different areas that we measure if they can eat the microbes of their healthy relatives. I so, knew we were gonna to get to fecal transplants <laughs> at some point in this conversation. <laughs> yeah. So it makes you Let's think not about it, right? Yeah, I know. You sorry. Guys don't try these at home. Don't try these at home. <laughs> <laughs> But it raises the specter. I mean, where, where it's, I'm not saying we're there, but it raises the specter of some kind of fecal, you know, microbiome transplant at some point. But we're not that's, there yet. It's a very, it's a very interesting area. Um, we have a very specific question that's came in actually, um, Terracio, with regard to participation in clinical trials. Uh, can a patient participate in more than one trial? Is that possible? Uh, yes. Um, depending what trial, let's say for, there are some trials that during the time of the trial, uh, only one experimental drug can be used, but the trials that are just observational, that do not require a drug, um, those can be more than one. And in terms of drugs, usually is one, as of course, uh, there could be the possibility, like you heard today, that a trial may include more than one drug. Remember that if we would have, let's say, two approaches available to increase the protein, we may potentially use two drugs, but it would be within one trial. Did I answer that, Adrian? Yes, yes, you did. I know for the okay. confirmatory trials, it's very important um, not to be able to um, to understand the, the drug that you're testing and that, you know, the inclusion and exclusion criteria in a clinical trial protocol are very important. Perhaps in the earlier trials, um, we, we could look at that, but I think it, when it comes down to the more in, the later trials, then we'll probably have to be more strict about applying that. Um, we did have, I, we're going to wrap up fairly soon. Um, I also have a question about um, stem cell research. If there's anyone on the panel is familiar with stem cell research and has this been applied to FD? Is there anything going on in that field? I'd be happy uh, to yeah, say maybe, something. Yeah, yeah, you, you should talk about, yeah, okay, go ahead. You, you can explain go ahead, Francis, much yeah. Okay, me. so there okay. is a terrific scientist at the University of Georgia in Athens, Nadia Zeltner, and she has actually, um, she's working on stem cells. And so she's taken, um, patient fibroblasts and she can convert them into different kinds of neurons. And so for example, we know in FD, we lose, we have problems with sympathetic neurons. We have problems with the DRG neurons, the sensory neurons, and she can take patient stem cells and convert them into either sensory neurons or sympathetic neurons. And then she's trying to figure out what's different about those neurons that derive from the patient fibroblasts and um, finding already some really interesting differences. Maybe tell okay. them that they, they can volunteer sometimes and we, we may need another line, right? For sure, yes, cells. absolutely, but absolutely. Sue and, and what, you know, one well, of the issues that Sue was telling us that Previous studies with stem cells had been done with cell lines that are in a, in a bank called Corel, where 
Sue and other people had, I, I think you guys were the ones that uh, donated those sort of original cells that remain there. We, we now have the capability to produce, um, to, to give new lines of patients that we know very well. So the person that's working with that stem cell can try to correlate what happens with the patient and some changes in the stem cell. This sounds like science fiction. Um, it is a little bit science fiction, but there seems to, uh, there are a lot of interesting things. So it is good to also tell you that you may be asked whether you want to give a few cells in your skin in something that um, it, it's very, very simple to do a blood to produce these stem cells. And then uh, these very smart people that you are hearing about may give us uh, answers that again sound like science fiction. You know, can I, I add one thing? That, yeah. yeah go ahead. Just really quick, sorry. I just want to also mention Miguel Weil in Israel at Tel Aviv University. He's also made right. neurons from patient stem cells. So um, you might be asked to give <laughs> fibroblasts to him <laughs> in Israel. The piece I wanted Same to add is to that add something? to differentiate. Go ahead. The piece I wanted to add is to differentiate the work that Horatio and Francis described in terms of using stem cells to understand FD versus stem cell treatments. And that's a very different thing, right? So we're, we're, we're um, I don't know that anyone is pursuing right now, uh, you'll hear about stem cell treatments for other rare diseases that involve bone marrow transportation transplantation or reintroducing stem cells into patients. And that's a very different thing than what we're talking about when we think about using patient fibroblasts to transform into different neurons and then study what goes wrong in the disease and the differences between these neurons. Okay, thanks for clarifying that, Sue, of course. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes. I mean, remember that we were not referring to treatment. We're right. referring to understanding. Um, Sue, thank you. I as everyone can see, we just like chatting about these subjects and we could probably sit here for many hours asking ourselves the same questions. Um, we don't have any answers, but we really, really enjoy both working together um, and interacting. And I think we've got some great scientists and it was really nice to be able to share a little bit of our interaction and to try to answer some of the questions um, that we've been asking ourselves. Um, so unfortunately, we're approaching what's here is 9 p.m. in the evening, and I know it's 2 p.m. in the afternoon, so you're probably getting hungry over on the East Coast. Um, so I, it leaves me really only to say thank you to everyone who's contributed to the panel today and to the science presentations. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone in the foundation who supported the SAB, in particular Lainey and Faye and Laurent and also uh, Natasha. Um, I really would like to thank the members of the SAB. I know that some of them are uh, watching. Um, in particular, um, I wanted to thank Ralph as well for his contribution. Um, and I know that we've had a uh, full complement of, of clinicians as well. Um, and it's really been great. And we're really quite excited about, we hope, what will be really important new treatments um, for, our, for our patients. And she's basically, for many of us, is for our kids. Um, so thank you. And with that, I will hand it back to um, to the foundation. Thank you. Well, it's thank you, Adrian. It's hard to believe, but we've come to the conclusion of today's program. Three hours went very quickly. Um, I'd like to extend heartfelt thanks to our amazing speakers who joined us from near and far. We have learned so much about the latest developments in FD medical care and research, and the news is quite encouraging. I also want to congratulate our distinguished FD awardees, Kelly Brotman, Rebecca Newman, Ram Shalov, and Avi Zimmels. And thank you to everyone who participated in the FD art contest with your fantastic submissions, and congratulations to this year's winners, Ivan Zelion, Peter Sonnenschein and Sam Landau, and special thanks to Kaya Delamo from the Dysautonomia Center and Rick Gadotti from Positive Exposure for coordinating this fabulous art competition. I especially want to acknowledge the foundation team who worked hard to produce today's program, 
My colleagues, Natasha Weinstein, Aaron Breen, and intern Gabby Sadanoff, as well as Leanne Lug, who served as liaison from the Dysautonomia Center team. Just a reminder, the foundation needs your help. Please consider supporting the foundation or the FD organization in the country where you live. Your donations help fund medical care and research that ensures better and longer lives. Check out the donation link in the chat box or visit the foundation website anytime. You can also help us by fundraising for the foundation, participate in our fall crowdfunding campaign, join or create a Team FD walk, run, or other endurance event, or contact us at the foundation to find out about other ways to get involved. One additional reminder, the karaoke after party will begin on Zoom at 2.15 in less than 15 minutes. If you're already registered, you should have received a link in your email. There's still time to register though, using the link in the chat box. We look forward to seeing you there. And while FD Day is over, our conversation does not have to be. Let's continue to keep in touch. You will receive a post-event survey. Please fill it out and return it to us. Your feedback is important and will help us make next year's FD Day even better. If you still have questions that did not get addressed today, send them to us and we will do our best to get you an answer. We want to hear from you. Please let us know how the Foundation can continue to be helpful to you and to meet your needs. Working together, we can accomplish so much more. Thank you and goodbye.